Welcome to the Daily Dev Talk with me, Adrian Nanchev. Adrian Nanchev, where we explore and share stories the best game you can. Stay tuned for today's episode. Good morning, Overload Nation. Adrian here, and I'm talking with Aranda Morris at Heroes. Aranda, to you. Tell us a little about yourself, game, and the studio. Hi. Uh, we, I started Nomic Studios with um, a uh, Scott Miller back in around 2000 and so Scott and I worked together in a, a simulation company 3D sim- simulation training and and we, we were always talking about making games and um, you know talking about what it'd be cool to do in a game and eventually we just went well let's just um, Scott's got an amazing quirky art style which I'm sure you'll you'll gather if you you have a look at Square Heroes or the original title aiming for the Microsoft had a dream build play competition which um, had some prize money and so that's what we did and we um, we were actually making a platformer zombie defense sort of a game uh, so we went that there's no way we can we can um, realize that idea so we stripped everything back and cut it right back to a with um, which is kind of a bit of a combination of like cod nazi zombies and geometry wars and it, it um it ra- ranked in the top 20 which was great and we released it in 2009 and basically since then i made square heroes which is the sequel um and has yeah pretty much what square off has but online multi on steam just in the last few months you said that before you started Nomic Studios, uh, you were a tools engineer or tools. So we're, we're talking like um, code and uh, software programming, or, or is that outside yes. the games industry? But, um, I've had some jobs in the game, games industry before, but this is um, a 3D simulation company. So they make training department and make their tools and improve their processes. And yeah. So that was for a serious. No, yeah, well, not not a game at all. Not not even. Um, it's, it's yeah, literally training, three D training. I think flight simulator. Interesting. Uh, that's an interesting game idea for anyone. I see yeah. what you mean. Interesting. Um, you said you started also the crash and the um, financial situation in the world at the time. Oh, did you start it in response to that? I think it might have actually been more in the start of 2009 when we just went, right, let's actually just make this game. And then it was the end of 2009 when we realised we had a game and we'd placed in the competition, so let's, you know, make a company and, and release the game under the name of the company. We, we're always, you know, we, we play games together and um, constantly talking about making games, so um, we've uh, been interested in doing since I was very young, like learning to program. I think I learned to program because I wanted to make games. Um, things like uh, um, Bubble Bobble, um, Spy vs. Spy, and like and then on the Amiga games like Spy, I was on those sort of multiplayer games. Yeah, I think a lot of people would have gone into the games industry from pure passion, whether it's playing games or just wanted to create their own. No, I think you're right, and um, that's probably why there's such a lot of competition now, <laughs> because there's so many of us that just love doing it. Um as opposed to that, the technology is ever more affordable and accessible and even easier to use. So there's more. So it's becoming increasingly easy for people, whether one man band, two or three, or smaller or such, can create games and there's the world easier than what there was, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Yeah, no, that's that's very true, like with things like Unity. And, um, it's very true. The, the other side of that is, though, that as, as it gets easier it gets harder to get noticed. It's always going to be a challenge. Um, and actually, writing games is from, if you, if you, if you go, right, well, let's, going to, let's make it be a huge amount of work and a huge challenge. Or even some of the most simple games, you know, if you, you can sort of whip up a simple prototype, really, um, always much more work than you think. Yeah, I understand that. And, and quality is uh, generally detailed or amazing uh, mechanics. Some people might simply some people might simply not enjoy, like for example, some people who would play Square off would not. Yeah, absolutely. No, you, you can't please everybody. That's for sure. Well, no, not heroes, because I've played a little bit of this and I I really like it. 
I like the art style. I like how it is competitive without being complex. I like the controls. I would say half an hour, 40 minutes roughly, and it is. I like it a lot. Oh, cool. I like it a lot. I think that with the right kind of marketing and the right kind of expansion, uh, dare I say, it could could challenge uh, League of Legends and Dota. Wow. As regards to that, uh, as regards um, that that level of sportsmanship, the esports kind of idea to it. Oh, that's an amazing uh, compliment. Even a small fraction of that sort of. Uh, um, well, yeah, play, but at the same base, time, but... you, you've got you've got to also manage it as well. So, wise, has to be gas pedal just right. <laughs> but the idea was with the right kind of marketing and the right kind of scaling, it has that potential. Because there's what character, little monster character, and the main character is all square, literally a square hero. Yeah. And all the all the little monsters that fly around are completely different in their own way. Because I th- I think they deflect the bullets. I'm not too sure. But I think it has that competitive edge that a lot of players... What we're trying to do, you know, that's that's exactly it. We wanted to be a sort of a fast-paced competitive game that was... Just, or, or randoms online, or even um, locally. Um, and, yeah, like you say, kind of pick... And, and you can just sort of just have a couple of quick matches. You know, you come home from work and have a... Each match might take you know, five to ten, I guess there's the casual aspect there, but also potentially the competitive aspect, like you say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that, yeah, again, that the challenge lies is to, you know, get get the interest um, in the competitive side of things. Um, one, one thing I didn't fully understand, because I, I think I skipped accidentally some of the tutorial, was the coins. I didn't understand far that you could unlock new weapons, like the from the spanner to the pistol to the shotgun to the rocket in the level. And, I, yes. and that accelerates or it, uh, it it progresses as the game goes by. Start off, starting off with empty, practically empty map with nothing but bits like points nine to nine, need one more kill, and it's it, it's quite quite edgy. Yeah, well, that's, that again, yeah, you make you know, of the game other than, you know, it's a, an arena shooter, right? Like the core mechanic is mm-hmm. that you got this weapon progression through the game, Dota and League of Legends, I guess, where you've, um, you know, you what do you call it, farming the creeps? It's a bit like yeah. that, where you, you're killing, you're whacking these little aliens and get to your your higher weapons faster. Um, oh, yeah. So that was that was that was what we were trying to do there to give a bit of variation from a bit of a challenge with the balance, right? Because obviously, um, there's always a danger in that sort of thing where um, if it's someone else. So we've sort of balanced that with ammo um, usage, so the rockets run out of ammo fairly quickly and um, with them. And so it's certainly mm. possible to win a, win a round like, without getting rockets and when other people get them. Um, but, yeah. Yes, I remember when I first got the rocket, that I thought it would be just like um, the pistol or the shotgun. And then I shot once and that was it, powerful. It wasn't OP. While... The baseball bat, the melee, I think, is a little bit OP. Yeah, you I, I, just jumped right lots, I suppose. The, the mm-hmm. melee can be OP because they're not quite as good at running away from someone with a, a big baseball bat as, as you know, human player. Another aspect of the balancing with the um, the single player and the bots, um, the AI yeah, is, is... And the reason we, we made the melee fairly, um, uh, fairly high-powered was... If we all of of scoring a kill, um, and just be flying around looking for ammo and nothing else, so the me- you know a high powered melee gives you a chance. Yes, uh, I think I managed to get a 10, 10 kill streak on the one of the levels or something like that uh, near the end. Nice. It wasn't predominantly with the with the melee, but that really helped at the start. But and a few strategical game play mechanics like the exp- I, I enjoy it a lot, and certain aspects of it I think have a lot of potential. And um, one thing I really, really like, but the environment is 3D. It worked pretty well with the lighting. You don't see that 2D, 3D mix very often, a platform adventure game. But you just don't see that very often. Is there a specific reason why you chose 2D and 3D? Uh, and that's that's a carryover from Square Off. That's what we did in Square Off. And um, really down to... Um, like the time it would take to, to build those characters in 3D. And they, they look really good of effort and animation and stuff. Um, and the, the environments, I suppose, is um, 
perspective and stuff and the parallax because mm-hmm. Scott is a 3D artist, but he's got, you know, skills in 2D as well. So I guess the 2D characters and, yeah, we just sort of, we, we came up with a system that, that worked, I guess. And the physics is in, but with some 3D environments built in there, I suppose. Yes, it's very, very nice and very polished. I especially like the death animations. Uh, mournful and sorry, and then the score drops to the bottom, and then it's like, okay, let's get back in the game. I need to wait. Press fire in a few more seconds. It's like, uh, because because everyone else could be in, in one area. And that's not really fun. You, you just get back in the game. I found that the map's a tiny bit small, a tiny bit, maybe maybe, maybe a tiny bit bigger than they could have needed to be. And I yep. found that the elites, because every now and then, when I was on a kill streak, I needed some more health. And it's like, I need to avoid everything and run around. And where's the explosive uh, one, Mark? Oh, let's go for it. <laughs> and it was, it's just that. That's why I mean, like, it, that's what I mean by it's competitive without being complex. One thing we, we sort of could have done and didn't do was sort of put the square off mode into the game. And we're, we're, there's a mode in there called survival, which is, you know, the, the aliens turn on you. They're, well, they, they're not docent. Basically, they just keep on coming and you have to survive. But in Square Off, it was sort of split into waves and it was endless. So they'd come, sort of come back and they'd spawn more aliens and then they'd sort of get faster and faster over time. Um, and it by rounds. And so we were, we're thinking about doing that because that was um, like a co-op sort of a game mode, which we, that's one option for us anyway for, for updates. Mm. The other thing I should mention while I think of it is that we're porting it to 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 do that. We've got the dev kits and we're um yeah we're working on it right now. It's running on the PS4. Ah, that's work. If it's in the uh, PC. Yes. Yeah, that's how you can play with local multiplayer. So you just plug in say three mouse keyboard, or you know, I think if you've got a controller plugged in, it'll default to controller when you sign in. So the um keyboard and speaking controls there's one thing i really liked about it when you change your weapon i think in the tutorial with that frankenstein to hold down a button and then hover over and then release but i noticed that later on if you just scrolled up up with the mouse wheel it does it automatically little controls and little things like that which give it that competitive nature where it's like there's a guy there's a guy there change the pistol quick okay he's, there's an explosive one there change your shotgun shoot yeah. change back to pistol finish him off anything like that yeah. And it, uh, that's, that's what I really liked about it. So you must have, I guess, if you've been playing yes, for half an hour. Yes, I unlocked the, unlocked the spanner. But I, I don't get it because are lined up. Yeah, that's is, right. Is, so that's, you, that's, that's your loadout for the for the level. Yep, yep. So I suppose you choose your weapons at that level. I fully understand that now. Okay. So I was anticipating, however, that there was a way of uh, changing the jetpack. But that wasn't the case. Well, there's another thing we've been thinking about, which is a possible feature would be like a boost or, a, you know, like a dash thing that a lot of other sort of dash or maybe a shield. So these are other things we've been thinking about, but they, they almost make it too complicated, <laughs> almost, you know. like Yes, yeah. Mm. Sweet spot of complicatedness, if that is such a phrase. <laughs> um, but what, what are you talking about? Um, because there are, um, there's like 30 levels, and each time you level up, you unlock a new either melee, um, and I'm just wondering whether you felt it sh- was unlocking quickly enough to keep you interested, or do you think maybe it should be a bit quicker? About yeah. that, to give you a definitive answer, I I feel at the moment feel slightly slow, yeah, because I noticed that on like, the first level I had a spanner, and I was using a baseball bat, and the level after that, the monster had an axe, and I was using a spanner that it was slightly behind because I feel that I don't want to go too close to him when he's got an axe because he could <laughs> one-bomb me and I've only got a baseball bat or a spanner. The same in data-wise, program-wise, data, you know, uh, yeah, in yeah, hints no. or variables. But well, I actually didn't no. feel it. It's not that axe is quite a lot more. Exactly. That's why, I, that's, that's, why I feel, that's why I feel that it didn't progress fast enough because somehow always the enemy see, but I can, I can feel that it didn't have that sense of... Um, catching up like they were they were going too far ahead yeah well i guess it's another from the there's the rate at which these weapons are dropping like let's say you're playing through the single player campaign or playing through some online rate that you're like okay well i'm gonna 
I'm waiting for my next weapon and it's keeping me interested to, you know, to keep playing another couple of rounds. To... Mm-hmm. I, I only got to the second row, so I don't know what other kind of games there are. I noticed a survival, but I didn't play that in the studio. Yeah, that's a, that's a little and, mascot. And yet, yeah. And you have, to, you have to stay around it long enough, which is kind of like Capture the Flag. It is. Point, capture the Point or mm. something, yeah. Yep. Yes. And um, that teams are two. I was, I was wondering how the AI would react on that. Like there's that there's that um, squid-like character. Mm. And uh, the robot one, I really like the voice on that. It's just the, the audio, how you did that, character very nice. And, and But the monster had a picture, but I can't remember what he sounded like. He's sort of growly. We, we actually got a, um, a voice of voices. So he did the mm-hmm. scientist's um, voiceover at the start in the tutorial. But also mm-hmm. all, all of those character voicing the, like, you know, the double kill announcements. Oh, yes. Uh, I was expecting that. Yeah. When, I, when, I, when I did the kill, I was thinking, later on, it's like killing spree. And it's like, yes, <laughs> there it is. There's that cl- almost cliche, almost generic, you know, it is in cliche. an arena. It is cliched, but it would wouldn't be the same without them, right? Like you, oh no! You need some no. kind of um, some of those in a row. Exactly. Yeah. And speaking of really good thing, Aranda, what's the one really big thing you learn? Sure. Well, um, probably the biggest thing is just how hard it is to make uh, like player games. Um, mm-hmm. That is a huge challenge. Um, Particularly, like we we chose the the peer, which means that um, when you're, you know, when your computer's talking to someone else's computer, it's talking directly to them. It's not a match, and it's telling them where you are and where you're flying to, and where you're shooting and and all of that stuff. And that the the benefit of that is you you, you know you move, removing the middleman, so you it's a it's a big help correct to your peers, but. Um, the disadvantage is, it's it's just harder to harder to to do basically. Straight off the bat, that any uh, any arena based game or any competitive game, the balance will be a bit of an. Mm. And the the code thing, when you say peer to peer, you, you um, the opposite of that, that server based, where it's uh, hosted on their on their network or peer to peer. Just rem- remind me of that again, please. Yeah, so you can't because um, client servers typically you'd have a dedicated server which has got a lot of bandwidth, which means it can hand upload at a decent rate to all of those connections at once. But when you do a peer-to-peer game, and if it's in servers running when they're up, um, and then those I suppose are not player hosted because there it's normally yes player hosted and peer-to-peer. So um, if that, I'm not sure if that quite answers your question. Is that yes, it's a peer-to-peer model using a peer-to-peer mm-hmm. model. Yeah. So, so you found that the peer-to-peer was more effective and there was less lag, or was that well, too simplified? Well, we made the decision from the start that we were going to go with peer-to-peer because we we didn't want that extra latency. Because yeah, we just felt that 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 the latency was really important in a sort of a fast-paced game. Someone else fires you see on your screen and so we have this this system where um you know it, it calculates where it's where it should now be like in, in other in other shooter games a lot of the time you just see the um the traces or you just see like instantaneous you don't see the like unless it's a rocket you don't see it flying through the air sort of thing you know what i mean um uh, yeah it's flying around the screen that um all need to be tracked and um and um, um, yes, yeah, certainly a challenge, and we did. We spent, you know, basically a year building that system, system from the ground up, and um, yeah, and did an amazing job. I think like we we can you can actually play the game. We could probably have a game and actually play, you know, and it, it'd be maybe 500 ping, but it would actually be semi playable. 500 ping is sort of playable, which is. You know, in my book, almost unheard of. I mean, playing games like Counter Strike back in the past, if it was really unplayable. Hmm. So it's very well optimized for international gameplay. Yeah. Well, it's, we didn't quite think it was optimizing that that networking, and um, it seems to have paid off. So you know, it can it can it can work. 
moment while working on this game. The moment of sudden realization or enlightenment or inspiration that shifted the game or the inspiration. Yeah, sure. Well, um, it's a hard one because it was sort of a, a long, continuous process, but I suppose there was one that spanned around two years of development and we took it to two PAX expos uh, in, in Melbourne, the other side of the country for us. And um, the, after the first one, it was in a fairly early state and it was only arena um, shooter slash brawler, you know, with you running it with flying rate. It's pretty much similar to what it is now, but play. And um, the, at, the, at the end of that, we had to make a decision, like, what are we going to do with this rescuing mode? You had to rescue these gnomes. But at that point, we sort of made the decision that if we were going to concentrate on a multi bosses, we had to really hone in on something. And it turned out to be that we would make bots and then that would, they would sort of become, become a tournament game it's in, in the vein of Unreal Tournament, where, um, you know, to train to train up, you can have an online game, but there's no one around, so if you've got some decent bots there, they can sort of tide you over until, until your friend's uh, decision to concentrate on the bots and use those as, you know, a core part of the single player was probably the, the closest thing to Yeah, because you, you, you then include the players... They, they they can play together as opposed to creating a plot and all the other in some games. And the yeah, and the cutscenes and the you know. Well, the... yes, depends on the engines. Not what your worst moment was while working on the game. Maybe some code simply didn't work, or someone was too delayed, or maybe a deadline was. Yeah, well. Um... ups and downs um, possibly I mean we, we, when we put it we put it on steam green light and doing that because with green light there's a big dilemma about when is it ready you know it, you don't want to put a completely crappy list and crappy I can't see anything in that but then if you leave it too long you know you um, it's the, the you know games could sit on there for you know, years even potentially before they get greenlit, um, and you. So we and and we got you know fairly far along with the game, and then we put it on green light, and then there was a, a nice bump of thousand votes in almost no time, and that was great. But then it just it went off the front page, and it just flattened out completely. It just fell off a cliff. Realized after that, a lot of people do a, like a combo thing with like a Kickstarter sort of starting around a sim starter sort of helps feed into the green light and, and vice versa. Um, and so we didn't do that. But uh, the hardest point during the development was just sort of sitting in the green light doldrums and going, are we ever going to get green light? Nowhere in the green light queue, essentially. Because there's green light, you see you get this number which says you are 33% of the way to the top 100. But, you know, if you... It's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel when um, when it, things move so slowly. And you knew this anyway, but you just have to work really hard at marketing it, um, push, basically drive all votes on green light. You just try and get as many, um, like do giveaways, like do beaters. And so we released on Desura and, and um, it's a beater, a free beater on, on Desura for people to test the multiplayer. And if they, if you, when it comes out, and so that was one of our one of our strategies that helped a bit. And then there are some bundles, so you know, like uh, after oh well, after we actually released on Desura as a, you know, the, the full the full game. As um, it can be known that <laughs> things didn't look so rosy. Yeah, make or break the situation while making the game. Yeah, well, we were we were kind of lucky to we actually got some funding from this. So they they had a something called the Games Production Fund for a while there, where they won funding for um, Australian you know game companies trying to build up the games industry, and um, you know that's not really we we thought we wouldn't have much of a chance of getting it. And then we we went to a, a local testing our game and, and demoing it for some people, and one of the 
the guys who works for the who works for Screen Australia who are doing who are doing. He came along and said, "Oh, you know, why don't you just apply?" And I can't, you can't, you know, you got to put in a fairly hefty application. And so we did that, and we, um, yeah, we actually got a grant of fifty thousand dollars for to to help us make a hallelujah moment. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that the um, the the government's logo in the bottom left corner on the yes. flash screen. That's it. Yeah, I, I, yeah. When I first saw that, I thought, "Hey, that's a little out of ordinary." Yeah. And, and yeah, to the right of that was no. And now you know why. Yeah, very nice. We don't, we don't hear that very often, especially in the especially in Europe or in the UK. When working on the game. Sorry, best. Best advice. Oh, oh advice. Yeah. Um, probably on the marketing side, I guess. Really, to. And and I, I struggled to take that advice. Don't stop talking about the game and spend. You know, a little bit of time every day, or you know, so put towards marketing, but from the start of when you start developing. But I think that's probably excessive. But as a developer, doing this, you know, singularly awesome thing, and that's all you can think about, and forget that, um, you, you know, you you do need to get the word out and talk about it, and then get it and play test it as well. Not obviously get people. Yes, I understand that idea about playtesting. Uh, one thing I like to do is give it 24 hours or a weekend, but not look at it. Don't be involved. Project with fresh eyes and think, yeah, you know what? X, Y, Z doesn't work as well as I originally thought. Or A, B, C. And nah, change this and that and other. So I... Tell me, Aranda, what was the best game dev-related book, lecture, or learning resource that you can recommend? Um, and and but, but personally, I find... You know, I've read a couple... And as a programmer, it's really, uh, well, there's a variety of websites, but probably the best one online is Stack Overflow for a range of sites now under the Stack Exchange. So there's a Game Dev Stack Exchange and you know, Maths Stack Exchange. But the way they've got the system set up, it really encourages people to give quality answers, and they've got a heap of people, like practically any question you might ask. And generally... You know, you can use Google and also the Stack Exchange sort of little technical problems. And so I found that it's probably, yeah, the top resource there. So that Stack, oh, Game Dev Stack Exchange. Yeah, so that's, I guess, that's the Game Dev centric section of the... Interesting ideas. And like an Evernote or a Trello, do you know of any useful or product productivity in sharing? Yeah, well, um, we did use Trello, actually, and found it really good. So it was a collaborative thing, and so you're trying to organize people on on different, you know, parts of projects and sort of a card there, and it's on a, you know, a whole set of cards. It's, it's quite it's quite a good bit of uh, – quite a good tool, really. Um, probably the most useful tool of, ev- of all um, is one called Beyond Compare, which something goes wrong, you sort of like, all right, how did that go wrong? I'm sure that bug wasn't there, you know, a week ago. So you look at the history, and when you find, lays out either two sets of folders side by side, and you see which ones have changed, which ones have got newer files where, or you can go down files next to each other and the bits of text which have been added to one or removed from the other. And, um, yeah, as any other sort of text comparing or folder comparing tool, it's great. Hmm. Sounds very useful. Comparing. Yeah, and good. speaking of speaking of curious, if you were in, in an identical world with the skills taken care of, how different would Square Heroes be, and why? Oh, that is a hard one. Kind of imagining that we would have, we probably may not have made that decision to say, right, let's um, let's got based tournament game we we may well have gone um there's you um there's not just the professor as a human character there are other human characters like the perhaps the the resistance leader is alien invasion that was one of the ideas we had where um sort of you're speaking to these humans and they're telling you to go out and do missions to and it would be 
de- you know, like a much a semi-puzzle based, um, story based sort of side scroll. So you would have turned it into a bit of a um, uh, Unreal tournament, so to speak. Um, you, what we did end up doing was kind of more the the Unreal tournament, um, where the bots you you have a tournament against bots and stuff. But yeah, we probably would have gone for the levels would have been larger and sprawling, and with you know some puzzles in the view and uh, that that sort of thing. I think that. Just a hunch, like that's kind of what we were thinking at the start. When oh, that, yeah, and you scale it down so it's m- much more manageable and, and much more approachable. Yeah, and more multiplayer focused. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, or well, yeah, well, if you do, you you know, you have to make a Skyrim or something, <laughs> which is out of the question for a team outside, of course. People at the core, but obviously there were mm-hmm. helpers with various things like music um, and sound effects and. And so, you know, that, that ends up being like a list more like 10 than 3 who actually contributed. By the government as well. So that's a very nice, yeah. nice well, that story. Was, that was very handy because that did, because, you know, we're, all three of the core team are with a side project. So that actually mm-hmm. allowed us to sort of take some unpaid leave and um, and actually work on the game full, like, not just during the evenings because things go very slow when you can only spend, you know, maybe 10 hours a week on it. Um, oh yes, well, I can only imagine. But yeah, eventually we obviously we hope to um, quit our day jobs and make make you know and look forward to doing that. Well, I'm very impressed with it, and, and I re- I like it a lot. I didn't I didn't know what to expect at first, and I was a little, but played that little tutorial, got into the game, and it's like this is a lot better than I thought. Playing it again and again with the two on twos and two just out of ten. Seriously, it came very close at one point, and a, bit, a few struggles with the, with no thing because it's like I keep stealing them, and it really blew my expectations away. Oh, that's great to hear because um, you know, obviously, the being a multiplayer focused thing, uh, one of our biggest concerns. Great to hear that you um, sorry that it that it you know that it held your attention like that. That's great. Mm. Um, you get your friends into it and. Um, next time you have some people around and you've got a couple of Xbox controllers, just fire it up and, and see what it's multiplayer, obviously. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yes. Or well, as potential. As potential. Yeah. Great, have a great interview. Nice talking to you. I'll see you on the flip side. Thanks, Adrian. Cheers. Adrian Nanjep. If you are a game developer that wants to get your name and game out there and to share your experiences and stories, then contact gameoverload.co.uk. Stay tuned for tomorrow's episode.